I fought the phrase no code for a really long time. I was like one of those people in the corner being like, don't call it that. This is not the right name. No, because no one cares about how much code it is. Like they just don't. Um, they, they don't want it to be hard. They want to have more control, but like the code part was never the point. Like you, it, it ends up bringing the community together. And for that, I am grateful. And I obviously, I lost this fight. That's what it's called now. Fine. But it was never the point. <laughs> Welcome to Generation Builders Podcast, brought to you by Softer. I'm your host, Mariam. The goal of the show is to unpack and share the superpowers and lessons of today's most successful software companies and discuss how the next generation will use and build software without code. I interview world-class product, growth, and community experts who help build some of the best companies of today Welcome, Zoril. Welcome to the podcast. So excited to have you join us today. Excited to be here. Zoril is one of the top experts when it experts when it comes to growth. She is most known for her time at Airtable um, as employee number eleven, helped build and scale marketing and customer success efforts. Zoril is also a co-founder of uh, Vaccinate CA California, which helped people in the U.S. get vaccinated in difficult COVID times. She's an advisor, angel investor, and very happy to have you also on board with us in many amazing startups and is now now leading growth and marketing at Block Party. So thank you so much for joining and really excited for this chat because obviously, as you as you can imagine, we <laughs> at Software and all of our community love Airtable. And uh, I'd love to take the chance to dive into this part, especially to start with this part of your experience. But any before before we jump into questions, anything you, you would like to add uh, beyond what I what I shared? <laughs> no, no, I think that's a great overview. Uh I you know, I think the the thread that's sort of gone through my career up till now has been trying to find ways to help people have more control over their online experience. Obviously at Airtable, that was helping them like make their own software. Now at Block Party, it's about helping people control their digital safety. But um, I know code and, and sort of these very flexible tools, much like software, are really, really important to me. And I'm so excited that the, the community is continuing to thrive and that I can hopefully be a little bit helpful in it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and... I know you started your career not actually outside the tech, right? Yeah. But we're really eager and savvy to try <laughs> to figure out ways to get into tech. And I'm really excited. I would love to understand and learn, just learn a bit more about that. And what was the motivation behind? Why, why that passion? Yeah, absolutely. So I think there were sort of two pieces to it. The first was really practical. I'm from the Bay Area. I sort of grew up in the, the broader tech sphere uh, and I wanted to be able to like someday be able to afford to live here again. Um, and tech is a great way to do that. But more importantly, I studied digital literature in college. Um, I was really obsessed with uh, the ways that networks of people um, interact online, the sort of ways that they're able to create things together, how ideas spread, how like we choose and elevate like thought leaders, all these sorts of pieces. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, I really want to be part of the action. I want to see um, how I can help sort of move all, all of this like incredible momentum and enthusiasm around tech towards solving problems that I think are really important. And so I looked for any way I could get in as <laughs> someone who was absolutely not an engineer. Um, at the time, that seemed really hard. Now, obviously, there's lots of paths, but back in the day, well, it wasn't so clear. So Nice, nice. And then you joined. So was Airtable your first company, tech company to join? No, I uh, I joined a really small startup called Crocodoc first. Uh, and I was the first employee there. And then that company got acquired by Box. And I was at Box through the IPO. And then I left Box um, after the IPO to join Airtable. So it was like number three. I was reading about you but while doing the research. <laughs> and I found out also regarding these networks, kind of you have even created like real maps of of how people are connected right <laughs> and uh, within the tech ecosystem and try to find ways to get like to the companies that you really like mm -hmm. is that is that true yeah that's true that's true it's a little nerdy but i you know i think people people sort of assume that the the personalities in the tech industry are um sort of like totally separated from the rest of us and that there's no way that you can um, 
find ways to to work with them if you don't already know somebody. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, all of us are just people. We're all part of networks. We all have relationships with with other folks. And I think there's this this little bit of um, sort of hero worship that happens and make people forget that like all of those people have teams that are helping them to like bring those amazing ideas into the market. Like they all can't do it by themselves. They all need sort of this support of the organizations thinking through these ideas, building stuff. Um, and so if you can figure out maybe less prominent folks uh, who are also working on those problems. Um, those people are just as interesting. They have just as mm -hmm. many problems mm -hmm. and they're going to be way more likely to, to sort of like notice a note from you. They're going to be way more excited to it, to engage because they're not getting constantly inundated by everybody. Who's like, Oh, that person's famous. I want to talk to them. Um, and, and frankly, like you're going to learn a lot more from them in many cases yeah. than from the folks who are just sort of the public faces of things. So yeah, absolutely. it's an interesting mm -hmm. approach, but uh, it works. So. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I can imagine, right? Like, it's those are typically also the people who are hustling their way through to to also getting things done and really um, trying to really earn um, where, where, or, or really get to like win what they really want to try to achieve. And it's it's very very interesting that especially in Silicon Valley, uh, like there is there is that network effects and the relationship building, right? That's also one of the, uh, I guess, really one of the key reasons that why it, why it really thrives and why in many other parts of the world, it's it's much difficult to you know, start companies and start yeah. networks and um, grow more successfully compared to, um, yeah. Compared Which to is not necessarily a good thing, right? Like, I think there's so many structural barriers that mean that folks who are outside of yeah, the Valley don't sure. have as much uh, access to those resources. And I think that's a huge problem. Um, mm -hmm. But it it, at very least, I think sort of thinking through the practical existence of the networks gives you the ability to sort of proactively see where maybe there could be an entry point. Since this is a system that we are working in, like, let's let's yeah. let's see how we can make it work. <laughs> I guess. Exactly. Cool. So then you joined Airtable. Uh, why why Airtable? Like what age, what stage was uh, Airtable like in terms of as a company, as a product when you joined? And also what I'm really keen to learn is uh, what was really, because you joined so early, I think you were probably the first marketing hire and you basically took the marketing function from zero to one. So what was it like? Yeah, for sure. So the the reason I joined Airtable so early was 100% product obsession. So I found it when it came out on beta, the first day it was on Hacker News, I signed up, I was, must have been like one of the very early sort of beta users. And it solved a problem for me that I had had for months mm -hmm. in 30 seconds. And I was like, this is going to change how everybody works. I have to have a piece of this. Like I have to go and help <laughs> because this is like, this is exactly what I've been wanting. I've been wanting to be able to like have some control over how I work and none of my software will let me do that. And Airtable will let me do this. This is amazing. So I got super, super excited about the vision. Um, I came in as employee 11. I was not technically the first marketer. There was a VP of marketing who predated me, but they did not last very long at the company and we didn't overlap. So I, I like to think of myself as like the first... <laughs> The first marketer who lasted, I guess. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but I uh, I definitely did sort of the zero to one phase um, with the company and, and learned a ton of stuff during that process. Um, lots of lots of weird, hard things to figure out, particularly for such a horizontal product, for sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and yeah. we will dive into that. What was the hardest yes. part? Oh, my gosh. Okay. Can I have two? Because yes. I feel like I feel like <laughs> there are two very there's different. There, I know things, there's too many. <laughs> there's too many. There's too many. But but there's two that I think uh, are really top of mind for me. So the first is um, pretty straightforward. It's just a prioritization when you are dealing with a product that this is fle as flexible as Airtable is really hard. You have so many use cases. There's so many potential channels. There's so many different potential audiences. Because you think about Airtable, it. Like the vision was always let people make their own software. And there's software for everything. So what was most important was figuring out what not to do uh, <laughs> and like disqualifying things, um, which is not easy when you get excited about lots of different opportunities like I do. So that was that was one really hard thing was just like mm -hmm. coming up with a framework, coming up with a system. How do we prioritize? How do we stop doing so much and really focus on what's going to be the highest impact first and then like be patient enough to wait for the rest of it? Um, and then I think maybe like a little less a little less straightforward than that, but still really hard and really interesting was um, learning how to 
value patience in both sort of like the customer journey and in public narrative. And what I mean by that is like, it took us a really long time, or at least me a really long time to realize that like, just because we had this very clear vision about why making your own software was going to be so fantastic and transformative for people did not mean that buyers cared at all. Like they did not care about that vision one bit. They wanted to solve a problem. Um, and, you know, I we spent initially a lot of time trying to help people sort of get on board with the concept and it, making that transition to realizing like they don't actually have to get it right away. Like they just have to get that it can solve their problem and then you can take them on a journey. Then you can help them understand the full scope of what's possible. Um, that was really hard. It took us a really long time. It, it required like a lot of, getting over a lot of our assumptions about what was going to be necessary to build a successful business. Um, and, and like, frankly, a lot of what I was excited about personally as a marketer was telling that bigger category story or that bigger story about like what was going to be possible if you made your own software and like to let go a lot of that mm -hmm. and say like, no, we're going to be patient. We'll get there. We're going to tell that story eventually, but like, let's just solve some problems for some people first. Right. Um, right. Because big, big most of the Very people important. do not really like, care or even understand what software, just, just software, right? It's very high, yeah. very hypothetical. It, the, exactly. What they care about is their problem. If you, exactly. if you can solve it, <laughs> doesn't matter. Even, uh, even now, right? Like when no code has become like a norm or people are using it, like at least in the tech, tech ecosystem, people know what it is. A lot of the times what we see as well is, it's just, um, people don't care about no code. They don't even mention that. They just want to solve a problem, especially in, in no, non digitized, non, non tech ecosystem. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, they don't even know what that is. And they don't care. This is, this is actually just as an aside. Uh, I, I fought the phrase no code for a really long time. I was like one of those people in the corner being like, don't call it that. This is not the right name. No, <laughs> because no one cares about how much code it is. Like they just don't. Um, they, they don't want it to be hard. They want to have more control, but like the code part was never the point. Like <laughs> it, it ends up bringing the community together. And for that, I am mm -hmm. grateful. And I mm -hmm. obviously, I lost this fight. That's what it's called now. <laughs> Fine. But it was never the point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's a, it's a good good way to lose it. <laughs> at least at yes. least it's it's helping in some other ways. <laughs> yes, yes. It ended up unite. being great. It ended up being great. But I, you know, somewhere deep in my heart, I'm like, no, the point isn't the amount of code. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally, totally uh, I get it. Um, and how so joining so early? Uh, mm -hmm. Well, most of the I guess like early on, uh, there was a lot of execution. So how did you balance the work between strategy execution? Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, in the very, very early days, um, and I, I guess even for so, several years after those very early days, we had a really lean team at our table. We were like, I remember really distinctly, we raised this really big round uh, where we were valued as, as a unicorn. Everyone was super excited. And like, we still had fewer than 100 people at that point. Like for a very long time, we were around 40. And we just cruised at 40 for, for a long time, putting out a ton of stuff. And everyone nice. thought we were bigger than we were. Um, but it meant that, um, you know, like I was still doing a tremendous amount of execution work, uh, despite sort of leading multiple teams and whatever else, because there's just weren't that many people. And like everyone had to do stuff. So uh, the way that I thought about this um, was essentially like... <sighs> For on the marketing side, uh, for each of the people who were on the team, and we're talking like, you know, three to five people, like not a large team whatsoever. How could we give them sort of meaningful areas of ownership, make sure they had mm -hmm. access to like resources that could help extend them, but then most importantly, be thinking about like, how do we basically never repeat work if we don't have to? Um, so like, how do we build systems that will make this as like, our effort as scalable as possible, um, where we can like plug in external resources so that like my people who have the most context don't have to go keep redoing that same stuff over and over again. Um, and make sure that everyone is really high leverage. And so that, you know, like for me, I could focus mostly on strategy and like managing the teams and the execution of sort of like recruiting, getting all the people in the right places. Um, and then if I was going to be, you know, doing something really tactical, like is it something that only I can do? Um, and just being really ruthless about that for every single person going all the way down. Like, what is what is the sort of unique skills and context they have that we cannot supplement elsewhere? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, like, can we take things off of their plate even further? Is that Maurice's, is this even actually being 
impactful enough that we should be doing it in the first place. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think that the joy of having a, a really small team in some ways is like, it forces you to have the, that discipline. Exactly. Uh, it it just possible. forces you to make that decision, right? You do, because you just can't do everything, which no, is uh, which is a which is a good thing. Yeah, I, I I'm very much prominent of um, oh, lean teams, small teams, as as much as you can, because um, just also, just also as you grow the team, it just becomes more um, more bureaucratic, slower, and things just get you know more difficult to. Um, to launch and to drive, right? So uh, yeah, yeah, there is definitely pros and cons on for on, on both sides. But yeah, um, oh, and also I think you know in the early days we tried to have more like less specialization, a little bit more sort of flexible team members. Um, obviously, as you grow the company, like that's not realistic. Right. You like want to make some specific bets and have people who have real expertise and can mm-hmm, take those to mm-hmm. the next level. But in the early days, because we did have those athletes, it meant also like you know, we're making these really intense prioritization decisions. You know, we could also cut programs pretty easily because we knew those people could be reapplied to other things. As soon as you Mm -hmm. have specialists, if you decide like, hey, you know what, SEO isn't working for us and you have a bunch of SEO specialists, what you are saying is we should not have those people in my company anymore. Mm -hmm. Like, Mm -hmm. and that's a much harder decision to make when people are not generalists um, because suddenly that's someone's job that you're making that decision about. So I think like part of it was like having the flexibility to move things around a lot because of the skill sets we had on the team. So we weren't like, well, if we decide to make a different strategic bet, goodbye Mm -hmm. to five Mm -hmm. teammates. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) Yeah. It's not not easy to do. That doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, And early on, what were the key drivers of organic growth um, of users in Airtable? Was it mostly kind of consumer driven? So you said you found... Airtable, it solved your problem. Uh, I don't know if it was maybe a work-related problem or a personal. <laughs> both both can apply. But was that how Airtable grew early days? And then with these customers kind of grew from their learning yeah. from more consumer-like customers. So we definitely had an initial pool of people who found us who were a little more in the consumer space. But frankly, like most of our growth actually ended up coming from businesses. And that was a really big inflection point for the company when we realized that we weren't going to be Dropbox. We weren't going to be Evernote. Like this wasn't going to be uh, like everybody's running their Boy Scouts troop on Airtable. Like that was never going to happen. It took us a while to figure that out. But when we did, um, part of that was we were looking at the, uh, the drivers of organic growth. It was almost exclusively like people adding collaborators and more specifically people adding collaborators within businesses. Um, Mm -hmm. And that virality within specific businesses and then across businesses in specific industries um, ended up continuously sort of driving the growth of the company for several years. Obviously we did a ton that was less organic to make sure that that continued, right? It wasn't just Mm -hmm. like we put the product out there and magically people arrived. Like that's definitely (laughs) not how that worked Mm -hmm. at all. (laughs) But um, it, what we what we figured out was that if we had the right entry points into these companies, into these businesses, whatever else, like then there was this little bit of a flywheel effect and we really would see the growth mm-hmm. uh, with strategic interventions in the right places. So I think um, to, to sort of try and abstract that back or like take a step back to talk about the learnings there, um, one piece was sort of figuring out what that like key mechanic looked like. Okay. It involves businesses. There's certain characteristics of businesses that we need to look for where we do see this growth. There are certain types of roles where we see cross business growth. And like, here are the intervention points that one are going to make sure that people are excited enough that they do want to champion us. So like, let's make sure the end of our funnel is really bulletproof and that people are having an incredible experience that they really get it that when they like bring it out to their teams they're not failing miserably to get other people to use it how do we lock that down so that every time they're bringing us someone new um that person becomes a node of growth themselves Mm -hmm. as opposed Mm -hmm. to a dead end um and all of the mechanics of that were incredibly polished there was a ton of stuff in the product around our collaboration flows that were like extremely smooth um and that you know, it it seems a little bit silly to overemphasize that, but like removing all the friction there was incredibly important to us. Um, Making sure that we were surprising and delighting people in the right places was incredibly important to like making sure we had that word of mouth. Um, And then at some point, once we figured out sort of the mechanics of that, then it was a little bit easier to say like, okay, now we can go into the existing customers that we have where we've seen this great growth and we can start like getting signals around new use cases that we could go do experiments 
that are paid uh, to acquire more of. Mm -hmm. Like, we Mm -hmm. think this is a great Mm -hmm. entry point to a company. Great. Let's go run some ads against people who have that title and see if we can get some more Mm -hmm. entry points to new companies, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Um, But it was really like, figure out the core mechanic, make it really smooth, and then like juice that uh, and then start like putting people in at the top because we know we're going to have this little machine that's going to make us more money down the line. Um, Yeah. One thing. One thing I'll say though, and then I promise I'll stop rambling, <laughs> is that uh, no, we, it's amazing. Go ahead. <laughs> we were we were really lucky that um, we could be because we had such high like lifetime value for our customers. Like once we retained that, well, once we got them on board, like our retention was tremendously high. They would invite a ton of people, whatever else. We could be a little bit patient and we could spend a little bit more money finding like the right people because we knew once we got them in the door, they were going to be worth Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. much to us. So I think like this playbook works really well if you know you're going to have the retention and you know that they're going to drive additional revenue. If you don't, you can't be nearly as like patient as we were you have to you have to have a very different type of discipline um but we we were willing to like go try a ton of different things to get the right people in the door because they were so valuable once we had them um Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so just worth paying attention to that that detail because if you don't have the lifetime value it it doesn't work yeah yeah that totally makes sense and what i what i liked really about so per basically trying to help them activate activate in a sense that they become the um the power, maybe not even the power users, but early on they get excited about the product, they want to use it. Would you say there was also a lot of effort on the product side um, being spent on on working on that, basically removing the frictions? Yeah, so definitely removing the friction to collaboration. I will say one thing we didn't invest in a ton of early, um, which was counterintuitive, was onboarding. Our onboarding was not good for a long time. I don't know if you remember, uh, like, the collab, like getting new collaborators in, perfect, fantastic, incredible. Actual onboarding, mm, not amazing. Um, and we, but how did band-aid- how then did these people ended up really having the exciting uh, experience? Was it like emails or was it an, a, other types of experiences you kind of embedded? That's what I'm trying to understand. Yeah, yeah. So what I was gonna say is we band-aided this in two ways. One was <laughs> one was like emails and content and stuff. The other thing was like, frankly, we spent a lot of money on customer success. Like everybody thinks about Airtable as this like pure product led growth thing. And we certainly had components of that. But the reason that worked is because we had customer success people who would reach out to you and be like, hey, I saw that you signed up and that you've invited some collaborators. What if I help you make this really successful? Let's get on a call. Let me help you with this. (laughs) Hey, I noticed you were really active and then you stopped being active. What if I just chat with you real fast and we like get you unblocked Mm -hmm. so this can be really impactful for you? Mm -hmm. Um, And we were lucky because people were excited about what they could build with Airtable. So they responded to that type of outreach. Like you have to have enough of a pain point that you're addressing or enough of a concept people are excited about for them to be open to that. Um, But like, I don't want to pretend that our onboarding was amazing in the beginning because it definitely wasn't. Like people helped with that tremendously. Um, And that was a a big part of the other part of my job was like getting (laughs) customer success managers there to like fill the gaps where the product was not helping people be successful at the front. Nice. Um, yeah. That, and that, that absolutely makes sense. Um, because like, that's one of the key, especially for these types of products where there's lots of, you know, people have to spend time building, have to stick with the product, right? There's lots of questions and problems they're going to have. Um, helping them and helping handhold through the building process is incredibly important. It's something also we have found and that, yeah, definitely can see how that impacted them staying longer and retaining longer. Um, Would would you say, were these people um, also customer support? Were they kind of also answering through chat or they would be more like individual individually reaching out customers? Okay, here here am I, I'm your kind of individually available customer success person just for you more like um high touch approach uh yeah yeah we, so we tried to have both i think both are really important okay. right like you need to make sure you have that like excellent customer support experience if people get stuck on something tactical right like they they get confused about f- I don't know, views and like you have to explain right. views to them. Like that's something that a, a, a customer support agent can do. And that's fine. And you need to have that. And, we and need you had that, that had also that. early on. Yes, mm-hmm. we did. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually we we had like engineers rotating through customer support so that nice. everybody understood the problems of our customers. 
it was great. But um, we also had those high touch people. And I think the trick there was we made sure we were picking the right people to offer that to based on um, sort of the learnings we had around which types of teams were most successful with Airtable, which teams were going to like invite people the most where we thought there was real growth potential. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's where we deployed those those um, resources. And uh, like refining that playbook was very important for us because obviously like that doesn't scale forever. You can't you can't offer every single new sign up their very own customer success person like that's not going to work at yeah. all um but in the early days it was really important for us and it did really help to over invest initially so that we understood enough to be able to build things that scaled more later awesome uh so jumping back to what you said earlier where i said uh okay we will dive in still uh, regarding the more <laughs> you know horizontal product and the go to market <laughs> approach so um can you understand how how are you thinking of this kind of approach in general and then how did you um leverage how did you kind of think of for Airtable's use case um of how who to you know who to reach out how to pre position the product because having having all different types of use cases all different types of customers etc it's just incredibly hard right and you have to you have to decide which one is actually the best to start with and you can just simply fail so how did you kind of approach that uh, was it one by one testing out um or just you know maybe launching a bunch of landing pages and a bunch of different campaigns and just seeing what what where is the demand yeah, absolutely. Uh, such a great question. And like, there, we learned some stuff. I think there's there's still like a, a tremendous amount that people are still figuring out and how to do this at all uh, out in the world. So I, I'm sure that the state of the art has continued to move on. But some of the basics that are really, really important that I can speak to. The first is, um, I always thought of about it as trying to make sure that we were building a system that we could repeat over and over and over again. Um, and there were two pieces to the system. The first was turning customer feedback into inputs for the growth team. So we found out very quickly that with a couple of very notable exceptions, our customers found better use cases for Airtable than we ever did because um, they were the experts. They knew way more about their pain points. They knew way more about like uh, yeah. where they had like searched for a, a point specific solution and failed. And so they could tell us where there were the biggest opportunities because they had already exhausted everything else. Mm -hmm. And now they were coming to us and building something. So like making that like little Little conveyor belt from like customer conversation to hey we have a really big opportunity here let's go test it um and doing that in a very thoughtful way was really important the second piece was um just for like assessing use cases and channels really really quickly because as as you noted like there's too many you can't do them all it's not possible so we we really took the approach of like one at a time not trying to do like a whole bunch of them at once um and we had a few different ways that we sort of scored different use cases that we were considering based on sort of the the virality that we would see within companies if we started with those use cases, um, whether there were dynamics within that industry that were really uh, beneficial to us. So the example that I, I like to harp on a lot is content marketing. Like at the time that we started making content calendars, um, it was like the hot new thing in marketing. Everybody was trying to build their content marketing stuff and there weren't a ton of really great tools out there. Um, so we were filling a clear need. The existing solutions were either Google Sheets or really, really expensive custom specific software that like was not keeping up with how channels were changing. So the other big thing about content marketing was because it was so nascent, um, the state of the art was constantly evolving and it was going to be challenging for vertical specific solutions to keep up with that, right? So if you were going to the best teams in the world who were doing that job, um, they could not use something hyper-specific because like, you know, you, you come up with a, say TikTok appears, suddenly you have to come up with a totally different way mm -hmm, that you're going to create mm -hmm. content for TikTok. Well, none of the existing tools are going to be able to accommodate that, right? And they have to go back to their product managers. They have to build yeah. all that stuff. Yeah. And then it, it's a year later before you have that. Whereas in Airtable, they could have it like the next day. So we were really advantaged against like all the legacy players in that type of context, that like high momentum, high urgency mm -hmm. environment where things are constantly evolving. Um, and because it was so hot, People were constantly jumping between jobs. They were trying to build their own personal brands and they would bring Airtable with them. And we were like part of the way they did their storytelling about like their methods and their approaches. And that's nice. amazing, mm -hmm. right? That helps so much in building out your uh, 
building out your brand because you become part of their identity and people will like fight for their identity. Yeah. And that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that worked out really, really well. But we had to look for those signals um, when we were trying to identify which use cases to go for. There were some we tried that were total duds. Like we, we looked at, um, there's a whole category of software around managing scientific labs, like lab mm-hmm. bench mm-hmm stuff lots of money in it there there's like a bunch of legacy players people spend a ton of money on it it's very core to the business um but like it wasn't particularly growing there were already really well established ways of doing that job and so all the vertical tools actually were genuinely better than ours were for that particular solution and most of the channels were not good for us like there wasn't really like a big twitter community where people would go out and talk about how they were using airtable and find new people um there were very like slow and not tremendously scalable approaches. Mm -hmm. But if we Mm -hmm. looked at that as opposed to like UX research where there were all these great network effects, like it was pretty clear which one we were going to pick. So Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would just say like, if you're in this position, you have to come up with the like scoring system based on what will give you those levers of growth and then be ruthless in prioritizing, go through your top ones. And while you're going through your top ones where you're pretty sure it's going to be successful, use that opportunity to also hone your system. So that you're figuring out how to get the the right insights. You're figuring out like, what is the package of things I need in order to test out a use case effectively? Um, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And like really build that foundation then so that when you get to your longer tail, you can move even faster on those because you don't want to overinvest in lab bench software if lab bench software isn't going anywhere. Exactly. You learn quickly and then move on to something else if it doesn't work. Uh, How data driven was all of this kind of prioritization and the decision? (laughs) I I mean, I can early on, of course, uh, I'm assuming there was some, you know, like there was a quantitative also data you were looking at, but a lot I can assume also was based on qualitative understanding of customers. Am I right? Or... Yeah, lots, lots of qualitative, lots of qualitative for sure. I would say we tried to be rigorous about our like logical models for how we assessed things, but the amount of data that was actually available, somewhat minimal. (laughs) So like, this is the joy of being an early stage company. Like sometimes you just kind of have to go on gut and look for, for things. The way I thought about it was, um, trying to be really rigorous about understanding what the leading indicators and the lagging indicators were going to be. So, um, can we can we like come up with a couple of leading indicators from a data perspective that let us know like we should cut our losses really early or like yes this is promising and so we should double down and invest further and like be a little bit more patient with it um and those things were typically um a combination of like assessing a few specific channels and whether we could get like the engagement we were looking for. So like, can we get the click through rates? For example, that means Mm -hmm, that like mm -hmm. there are people who hang out there with whom this message resonates. Mm -hmm. Great. I mean, a few specific ways of testing that out. Okay. Like, all right, once we get people in the door, um, can we get them to refer other collaborators within a certain window of time? And that's obviously the far end of the funnel. But like, if we look at those two things, how quickly can we get to the point of understanding the second part? Yes, we're able to get them to like invite more people. Great. Okay. That means like, if we need to finesse the middle bit, we like figure out the right content, whatever else. Okay. But we know we can get people in the door and we know that if we get them the right message, Mm -hmm. they will expand Mm -hmm. to other folks. That means this is probably worth like figuring out more. But I, it was definitely heavy on the art side and not so heavy on the science <laughs> for a while. Um, I'm so happy to hear that <laughs> because <laughs> you're not alone. <laughs> you always try to, as always, right? Every every startup I think tries to use as much data as possible. But also early on, I think that's the beauty of also early stage startups and the the right team you can assemble that actually even just based on qualitative metrics and a lot of intuition, lots of just experience, they can also make the right decisions most of the time. Um, and yeah, sometimes you're wrong. And like, that's, that's yeah, the way that companies exactly. work. But uh, yeah, there's like, I don't know, there's like lots of people who get out there and, and talk about like their super data-driven approaches and how they're A-B testing everything. And I was like, man, I don't know where you got that kind of traffic to be able to A-B test everything and get stats in, but like, good for you. I'm glad. I was not in that <laughs> <Exactly>. position. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but even, even in lots of cases, you know, um, like even data might, might tell a wrong story, right? Yeah, Sometimes exactly. even just the wrong 
one small wrong track in tracking might then just completely mislead oh, you. It's all such a mess. And no one ever talks <laughs> about how messy it is. You have to be like, can I explain this anomaly in any other way? Oh, I can. There's 12 other reasons that could have happened. Great. This is telling me nothing. Let's try a different experiment. See if we can figure it <laughs> out a different way. What is with this? <laughs> and um, so we talked about um, this kind of you experimenting with this different more like use cases, I would assume. And mm -hmm. how much did you try experimenting and how much did templates play a role in that? So when you learn there is this use case, this potential type of persona, did you kind of end up creating tons of templates for them or use cases for the next batch of similar type of users to find? Or uh, yeah, or was, was that um, not a driver at all? So we definitely did a lot of templates. Um, and and like that was actually a part of that little conveyor belt I was talking about, like customer insight to, to growth mm -hmm. metrics. Regardless of, I would say, assuming that it wasn't a an obvious one-off. So it wasn't like, this is such a hyper-specific tool that no other company would ever want this. For us, because we had really we had like turned into a template making machine. Frankly, we could do it really fast. The marginal cost of a new template, very low. Um, in most cases, we would just make them. The question was like, how much are we going to push this? Right. So, uh, you know, we would say like, okay, it seems like UX research is going to be useful. Like no matter what, we're going to make the one that's based on a couple co customer conversations. If it's come up more than twice, great. We'll make that one template. Um, when it made sense to double down was if if we saw like, hey, we're seeing tons of growth here and there are variations that will help us seem like we are more expert mm -hmm. in this area mm -hmm. and we're going to do blog posts and we want to be able to explain it. So mm -hmm. we need more examples, whatever else. Then we'd make more. But I think like the initial few, we always made a bunch of. Um, that said, I always like to dispel this like, misconception people have because I'm afraid people are making the wrong decision about templates based on thinking this was very important for us for the wrong reasons. Templates did not have meaningful SEO impact for Airtable in the early days at all. People were not finding us because they were searching and seeing templates. That was not what happened to us. That's true for other companies. Other companies were very successful mm -hmm. at that. That didn't happen for us. Templates for us were much more... Um, useful once we had already gotten someone's attention in a different way and then they needed to understand if we could solve their problem so mm -hmm. it was later in the funnel it was not acquisition at all it was like evaluation mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. so just know like when when you like hear about Airtable's template strategy it was incredibly <laughs> transformative for us super super important it was not acquisition it just wasn't mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do, you, do you have hypothesis why was that was it because of um yeah, yeah, why was I, that? Was it because uh, SEO a maybe wasn't... Uh -huh. it's a, no, is it a combination of us not having done a great job of optimizing them for SEO in the early days, mm -hmm. frankly, mm -hmm. uh, which like, didn't do a good job. And also, uh, I think, like, the types of the types of templates that we were building and the, the best way to make them really successful later in the funnel was kind of not actually as useful for SEO purposes, right? Like when you think about the types of templates that were really successful for like the smart sheets of the world who smart sheet ran this playbook in a tremendously mm -hmm. successful way earlier than we did. Um, they were going for uh, a very different like framing and way of doing it their purpose in putting out a template was much more like to the capture traffic, a mm -hmm. yeah and, and like the way the way it was framed was around a person who like was looking for like an excel template and then they thought like if we show them how hard it is in excel and how much easier it would be in smart sheet then they will convert we were trying to build something that was already going to be useful for you in airtable today and that's very different it's a different type of person who is looking for the thing like they already have to be a little bit more bought in um it was always more of a utility for us and less of a like high level mm -hmm. let us teach you how to do ux research or something yeah. like a little bit it was meeting them in a different place in the journey yeah um yeah I mean, I, I was actually expecting that kind of to be uh, the answer because I think that's interesting because especially like with no-code platforms as well, what we are seeing is, you know, a lot of the times if uh, like a marketing or salesperson has to pick and use the tool, um, in some cases, they either are solving the problem using Google Sheets or manual workflows, right? They don't even have a name of this app that they're, they're going to build. It's just, yes. a, you know, a use case that might, there might be a name, 
later down the line, but they are just trying to solve a specific problem, which is very specific, unique to their uh, needs. And yeah, the person is not going to just go, I mean, they might also search, but most of the time, because it's so, so specific to their use case, right? Uh, which is not that there's no vertical solution to do, you know, specific UX research type, gathering information, sharing with your team, et cetera. There's sometimes even no, no other solutions, right? Yeah. Um, so it, it totally makes sense. Yeah, I can, I, I, we can relate to that, I think, as well. On, on <laughs> yeah, for end. sure. For sure. Okay, quickly, uh, let's touch upon also some of the, um, what, what was really interesting, you mentioned this, it wasn't like we put the product out there and everyone started using it. So they, you had to, you had to let people know in some mm-hmm. ways that there is this product. And I know there was, uh, you, ha- you also run some quite unconventional experiments in your table. So one being the billboards specifically. Um, just curious to also understand why did you do that? And what was kind of your hypo- hypothesis when you, yeah. when you thought of that? For sure. So, um, Billboards were also not acquisition. Sorry, I feel like we're only talking about the things we didn't do for acquisition. <laughs> but we did billboards for a very specific reason, and they were very successful. Uh, and it was not it was not to get brand new users. It was to provide air cover to our existing champions when they were going to try and get budget, so that when they went to IT or they went to you know their their senior senior leadership, senior leadership was like, oh yes, I've seen that billboard. That's a real company, um, and that sounds so ridiculous. But you have to remember, we had what like forty, fifty, a hundred people. Uh, I had to like take clients that were large out to lunch and not let them into our office because I was afraid they would see how few people they had Mm -hmm. uh, like that we had on the team and they would be like afraid to spend as much money as we were going to ask them to spend. Um, And so we needed signals out in the market that we were legit and you could trust us. And for whatever reason, people really trust billboards. I think they think they're more expensive than they are. They're not actually that expensive if you're thoughtful about how you do it, um, but they're a great signal that you take things seriously and that you like operate in a particular way. And so we were able to use them to help our champions who really, really wanted to get these big contracts because they like wanted to use Airtable for lots of things um, to get the approvals that they needed just by like making us seem more legit. It sounds really mm-hmm. silly, but it worked really well. <laughs> So no, it's amazing, and it, what what it really uh, what I love about the story is just you knew why you're doing it, right? You knew specifically that that that, that, that was going to serve a specific purpose, and it, and it worked. It wasn't like okay, now let's try and test billboards and see if this this could work for us as an acquisition channel. And same with would you say the same with PR? So typically, also most of these software companies, you know, it's not the acquisition channel they are usually going after. It's not scalable, etc. So, what are kind of what are the uh, times or places where you should leverage PR in some ways? Yeah. So I, I would say if you have a compelling story. So, like with Airtable, um, buyers did not care about creating software, but but like journalists definitely did. They thought that was cool. So we had this very compelling story. We're going to help people create their own software. It's so exciting. It's the future of the future of technology, whatever. Um, Then you can use it as an excuse um, to move the needle in, I would say, really two ways. The first, again, is that like, uh, that like validation that you can use um, in sort of a sales context, right? So like suddenly you have all these like great references you can put into your outbound emails. Like there's all these like nice ways you can use it for social proof to be like, hey, we were, we were in TechCrunch, we were in Wired, mm-hmm. whatever. Mm-hmm. That's helpful. It just makes you seem more legitimate. Mm-hmm. And then um, not just for sales, you can also use that for recruiting. And actually that was one of the really big uh, places that we focused our our like PR efforts besides sort of the... Um, the like, look, we are more legitimate thing Uh, was just like, we have to get engineers to want to work here. Okay, how do we make them feel like this company is going to be a big deal in the future and that it's worth spending, you know, all their time with us? Like, well, we can point to these other external people who say that that Mm -hmm, what we're doing mm -hmm. is going to be really cool. The third thing for us, I think is a little less relevant for everybody necessarily, but maybe relevant for for software, at least, which is, um, when you do have opportunities to tell that bigger story or draw a bigger circle around yourself um, and say like, hey, there is a movement. It's not just about us. It's about this movement that does actually start moving the market in a way that helps um, helps change the types of ways that people are looking for tools like yours. So when we first started, no one was looking for no code. At some point, there were enough stories in 
like PR or whatever mm-hmm. else, mm-hmm. people started that being became, aware of really. that concept. And so suddenly mm-hmm. they were like, hey, there's no solution for this. Perhaps no code is the answer. And mm-hmm. that second part of the sentence takes a really long time to get. It's not just one story in one magazine, right? Like you got to mm-hmm. do it over and over and over again, but it does help. Um, and I think when you are forging new ground or introducing a new way of working, that is ultimately in a cumulative sense useful, but it's not going to change your numbers overnight. You're not going to be able to like point at the place where it happened when you're looking at a graph. That's not how it works. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's a, cool. it's a yeah. patience game. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely helpful. I think that gives kind of a bit of context. Okay. Where, where, where generally you could apply and where could it be useful? Yeah. Um, so going back to uh, the customer success part, where you also have led those efforts, uh, because you kind of you just shared all of the you know kind of the early story of how um, you have been helping customers through customer success people. So now I'm really keen to understand it. Also very applicable to to <laughs> us right <laughs> right now. Like oh, I've definitely learned from this. Uh, what you what you're gonna share? When is actually the right time to start hiring for customer success specifically? Being mm-hmm. this more not the salesperson yet, but this person who is going to be very closely working with the person, maybe with the customer, making sure they are successful. And who is the right candidate? What types of skill sets and kind of mindset should, mindset should they bring on board? Yeah. So I think for horizontal companies where you don't yet have a strong intuition for what your like anchor use cases are going to be, the sooner you can get customer success in there, the better. If you already have people signing up, then there are folks to keep them busy, right? So we were in this great position, which is very fortunate of having like a lot of signups every day that were coming in. Um, but we couldn't see how people were using the product because we really respected people's privacy and their data. So like we could not go in and look at anything in anyone's databases. We had no idea uh, what they were using it for. And the way that you bridge that gap is by having relationships with your customers and making sure they're successful. Um, And so for us, that like very early investment in customer success, like we didn't even have salespeople at all. Uh, I I think we had signed one, one contract that went through an invoice and not through a credit card when I hired my first customer success person, if that gives you a sense. Um, Mm -hmm. It gave us the dual benefit of, of like being able to sort of kick off some of the virality internally that you and I have already discussed um, and unblock a bunch of people who became champions Mm -hmm. and so Mm -hmm. on. But it also helped us figure out like, Hey, where should we be focusing our attention? Can we understand like what the needs are of this type of corporate user? What do we need to put in place here so that eventually when we do want to go do sales, we're going to be really, really successful. Like what you cases do we need to focus on? Who's going to be our champion? Like all these things we needed to figure out before we were going to go up and ask for, you know, like six figure deals. Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. There's other ways to do this. This sounds a lot like, uh yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, no, I should say there's other ways to do it. Some people do the top down sales motion and and whatever else. I think it's harder. It's harder for horizontal tools to do that. It just is like you you need more proof internally, especially if you don't have a category to play off of already and they don't know where the budget would come from. You need a lot of examples in order to show like, Mm -hmm. hey, it is worth Mm -hmm. making a big investment here. So Mm -hmm. for us early. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Uh... So this sounds really like what, what you're describing, what this person was doing in your team, a lot um, like a product person, what product person would do typically, right? Of course, like it's a question of how much time they should allocate to this type of work or um, because it's in the end to, to customers understanding use cases versus building the product together with the designers, engineers. But um, so what were the kind of the skill sets and the experience that these people brought on board that they were successful in doing this and then bringing back the use cases and seeing patterns for the team to to make sense of that? Yeah, so we couldn't hire a traditional customer success profile at all. So it's a really, really good question. Um, and the reason we couldn't hire someone who had like been a customer success manager 18 times before or whatever else in most cases at that time was... Um, In a typical engagement for Airtable, especially in the early days, we had no idea what type of problem you were going to have to solve walking into a phone call. Like you could even send them a survey in advance, be like, what kind of use case are you doing? Whatever else. And you'd still get totally blindsided by people. So what we needed from a skill set perspective was a really unique combination of two two or three things. Um, One was sort of the standard customer success, like... uh, personable, able to build rapport with someone quickly, all the like nice people Mm -hmm, skills, mm -hmm. which are obviously important. Yes. But the other side was like, can they uh, 
design a workflow from scratch with very few inputs just by asking really good questions. Like, do they understand um, how one might construct a product in like Mm -hmm. the most basic Mm -hmm. workflow sense? Because they're going to have to do it on the spot. Uh, They don't need to know everything about that. But like, can they break down a problem into its constituent parts? Can they figure out how to like put the Lego pieces together if we've given them a toolkit uh, based on what they're hearing from a customer? And then do they have that le- like lens of practicality of thinking, okay, like I made a workflow. Is it going to work for actual human people? <laughs> and what are the places where a-, a person or a system of people might start tripping over it? Um, and so where we ended up finding a lot of candidates was much more in sort of the like uh, consulting and sales Mm -hmm. engineering side of things. Um, Often they were a little bit more technical than you might normally see because folks who have a like more technical background often have been in a position to sort of understand how to assemble a workflow before. Um, Eventually we figured out how to train people on this stuff. And so we could hire for something different, but in the early Mm -hmm. days, Mm -hmm. like very flexible, uh, very consulting oriented, often in a more technical capacity was what we ended up looking for. Was, let's say, if you talk about the first person, was this person someone you hired from outside Airtable's kind of community or audience or user base? Or was that actually someone who was already using Airtable fluently and they they didn't necessarily have to be called customer success, but they they knew what how to do the job? Yeah, so uh, our very first person we hired from totally outside, um, though she had used the product a little bit. That said, eventually there were two very clear tracks in. One was uh-huh. like obsessive super user who loves the product so much that all they mm-hmm. want to do is play with it. And I actually ended up hiring a bunch of our early customers as mm-hmm. customer success people eventually because they were like, yeah, I know that normally I'm like a video production coordinator but what i really love is playing with my air table and like you you bring them in you figure out that they could do this sort of stuff and, mm-hmm. and ultimately we'd poach them sorry to yeah. our former customers um <laughs> the other side though are some of these like people who are excited about the concept and um you know our our first customer success person who is just like an absolute force of nature uh, her name is shawnee i don't know if you've ever met her but she she's leading a lot of these efforts at figma now um and she she like had gone to B school. She, uh, she's like one of the most like emotionally intelligent people I have ever met. So incredible on the the sort of like interpersonal side of things, very community oriented and constantly looking for ways to connect customers to each other so they could help each other. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And then also like had worked on the VC side some, had like a very wide range of different um, work experiences. And so because she'd seen so many different ways of working, had a bunch of like workflows in her head that she could recombine and put together in different ways in order to to get people to be successful on the spot. So mm-hmm. she, she was a, a very unique candidate and person in general. We got really, really lucky with her. Um, but you know, I think ultimately we sort of figured out those two patterns, like mm-hmm, super user mm-hmm. consultant yeah, of yeah. sort of technical side. That worked yeah, it's so well. difficult to find a combination of both yes. usually. Yeah. Yeah. I have heard great things about her. I have her on my list too. Yes. <laughs> for the podcast. I hope you amazing. do. So, <laughs> <laughs> amazing. So we spoke about also, we touched on community just very quickly on that, because mm-hmm. I think one, one of the Amazing things that also Airtable has done really well is building this exciting, passionate community around Airtable. I don't know how early that started. So would you say it started with this customer success kind of team, helping out the customers and then customers becoming evangelists of the product? Or was there specific efforts kind of towards community? Maybe there was a person or some things that you would do around the community. Like I, you said, this surprise and delight. So maybe that's, yeah, um, things like this, which kind of, Things are more uh, outside facing and more for just delighting customers and helping them also to connect to each other. But yeah, tell me, tell me a bit more. Yeah. About so that. Um, we didn't have a formal person who was like the head of community anytime early. It was it was sort of baked into a lot of different people's job to think about like how do we make our customers mm-hmm. feel the sort of supplies and delight. Um, I would say there were sort of three pieces that helped to instigate the community that we had. Um, The first one uh, 
was some of that like very manual customer success intervention, connecting customers to each other. We did these um, these tours where we would essentially go to a whole bunch of different cities um, and use it as an excuse to get our champions together mm-hmm. at dinners. Together. And like, to be clear, not the buyers. This was not like the VP of marketing mm-hmm. at whatever big company. It was like the person who is spending their Friday night with a glass of wine working on Airtable. <laughs> we'd get all of those people together in a room. Um, and like, spend a bunch of money on a fancy dinner for them and make them just feel like incredibly special. Um, and those people stayed in touch with each other. Like they, they started their own kind of meetups and started doing things and they were really the nodes of communities in specific regions. Um, we didn't have like a formal project or program in the same way that something like notion did, for example, Mm -hmm. it was Mm -hmm. much Mm -hmm. more sort of informal. Um, but they, they also were doing a much more consumer play than we were. We were going like very business. And so we tried to build sort of these business networks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The second was definitely like, more more bribery there was lots of swag there was lots of like hey i hear you're giving a presentation can i help you right like lots of very personal touches to get people to feel like they wanted to be the public faces of airtable and just supporting them at that as much as possible um and then the third piece was really around um making sure that our product allow them to create a platform for themselves. So we we had this thing called Airtable Universe where you could sort of publish your Mm -hmm. own Mm -hmm. templates. Um, We, from the very early days, even before that existed, we had the ability for people to embed uh, their their Airtable bases on websites and so on. And Mm -hmm. that helped a lot of folks um, create their own sort of little communities around the tools they were building themselves. And we just tried to make sure like we stayed out of their way and let them do that. If they wanted to sell templates, great. Like go mm-hmm. forth, mm-hmm. make your money. Like if you want to have a meetup, nice. amazing, yeah. like we're going to help you. Um, but we didn't, we didn't necessarily say like, we're going to have a formal community program because mm-hmm. frankly, mm-hmm. we had so many other things going on. We kind of couldn't. Uh, so we just tried to make sure we had like really human relationships with people and that we were like mm-hmm. supporting mm-hmm. them in the best way. And that you we just empowered could. kind of empowered yeah. them and gave all the tools and the necessary yeah. uh, whatever that was for them to to keep doing what exactly they doing, i wish i could be i wish honestly <laughs> that we had been able to invest more in yeah. like more formal programs frankly mm-hmm. i think they're doing that now um but hard trade-offs are the world of startups so yeah <laughs> but all that uh, all that from outside it doesn't seem very you know um very obvious but i think those are those little things play really key role in in just general right like making sh- making these customers feel like they are they are um valued they yeah they love the tool and then they want to become the evangelists of the product yeah yeah exactly um, makes so much sense um cool so um yeah i'm gonna close the kind of questions <laughs> and <laughs> enough about the airstable <laughs> just want to spend a bit more time also on the other project which is really uh, something impactful you have been working on and really want to touch upon that as well so after airstable when you left you started a very impactful project called vaccinate ca or california that helped as many people as possible to get vaccinated um mm-hmm. in the u.s okay. how did you join that why did you start that um yeah, what was yeah. the motivation behind? Well, well, it's kind of kind of obvious. But <laughs> yeah, so so obviously trying to help people uh, get get access to vaccines in the U.S. Um, right now that seems like a really trivial thing, but back mm-hmm. in the day, um, not only was it not clear where you could get a vaccine, um, it also wasn't clear like who was eligible or what type of vaccine you could get or like what process to go through in order to care. And there was mm-hmm. a lot of fear at the time. Uh, so I originally, I didn't start it technically. Technically, um, there were a few people who sort of self-organized on Twitter uh, and I created a Discord server for it as this guy named Carl Yang and then um, Patrick McKenzie sort of uh, signal boosted and then ultimately ended up being sort of like the leader of the the whole pack. Um, I got brought in initially, maybe like a day after it started, things moved very quickly. Um, because one of the members of the t- early, early team was an Airtable employee. So we were, we were colleagues um, <laughs> and they had started getting a bunch of weird press attention and they like didn't know how to handle the fact that reporters wanted to talk to them after a day of existence. So I originally was like, sure, I'll help you figure out how to talk to the press. It seems like it'd be useful in spreading the word. And then one thing led to another and somehow I'd like quit my job at Airtable and was on the board and helping to run this organization. Okay, so you quit, uh, quit at Airstable to join that I did. Project. Yeah, I did. Oh, wow. It felt like the most important thing I could be working on at the time, um, which wow. in retrospect feels a little bit mm-hmm. wild. But at the time I was like, well, I like, this needs to yeah, be what I I'm spending my time on. Yeah, I can just not do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
And I like, we yeah. were getting messages from people being like, I think you just saved my parents' life because I hadn't been able yeah. to get them this thing and they're immunocompromised. And like, when you're getting messages like that, it's very hard yeah. to be like, oh, I want to go back and, you know, work on this other thing that, I, yeah, that yeah. I've been doing for more mm-hmm. than five years. And like, I feel like it's in great hands. Like, do I go and like, just try and make it 1% better? Or do I go mm-hmm. try and help mm-hmm. save people? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Love, love the kind of spirit behind and, and the story that, and the, yeah, mm. you know, your reasonings as well to, to live your stability and enjoying this. Um, and I think one of the fascinating things here as well is that how quickly this turned around, right? How quickly you managed to basically set up the project, have mm-hmm. everything connected and be able to already provide vaccines to the people. And I think the baseline of that also was Airstable, right? Using Airstable yes. on the back end, which is, yeah, maybe tell like two sentences about that because I think this is, this is what really shows kind of the impact and, and the potential that, that just no code platforms are bringing, right? Yeah, absolutely. So on day one of Vaccinate CA, they had a spreadsheet. On day three, they had an Airtable base that was powering like hundreds of volunteers who were going and making phone calls to different places, figuring out who had which vaccines and publishing them on the internet. Um, and like, yeah, I think there were maybe four or five engineers who were sort of like connecting all of the dots to make it go on the internet in a custom way because they put on a map and a bunch of other really cool mm-hmm, stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the bulk of it was like a custom Airtable database that we spun up incredibly quickly. And the only reason it wasn't faster than that, it was three days instead of, you know, like two or whatever, was just that um, we started talking to public health experts and wanted to make sure that we had like the right information available. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. so there's a lot of like trying to make sure that we yeah, were being good yeah good public citizens. Um, But it was so incredibly essential to have tools where not only um, could we move really quickly and build up our database really fast, um, we could also iterate really quickly. And the people who were actually making the phone calls were able to go in and change the schema. They could say like, hey, this thing in in like the broader ecosystem has changed. Let's fix it right now Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. not wait three days or five days or whatever. Like we can we can have it fixed in five minutes. Um, And that's why we can move so quickly is, you know, like the the power of those tools um, to to get us where we need to go. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's incredible, I think. And that's exactly the power that first it it just exposes, it it lets you do things so quickly. And for these types Mm -hmm. of projects, especially, you know, you just don't have time, right? You have to act quickly. (laughs) And then that everyone has control of it. Everyone can really contribute also. Um, So that brings me to the other question, just, just, you know, uh, taking a step back and looking at the ecosystem overall. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you think are generally like work work and tools within organization day-to-day tools that I'm going to use to do my job are changing? How are those changing and how are, you know, companies adopting uh, newer, especially uh, no-code platforms like custom build, custom solutions to their workflows? Yeah. So a great question. I I have a very spicy opinion on this. So I think um, when we talk about what I will hear that, (laughs) what, what I'm, what I will begrudgingly refer to as no code uh, I think that I know ultimately- you don't like that word. <laughs> it's, it's, it's easy shorthand. I'll accept it. Um, I think ultimately it will end up being a design philosophy and not a separate category at all. Um, I think that absolutely every single piece of software that you touch at work, ultimately, you should be able to have more control over that experience. And I'll say, I think that means that there will be vertical tools that have a no code component to them that will Mm -hmm. be incredibly Mm -hmm. important to people's core workflows. And then there will be tools like Airtable and Softer and these other very flexible horizontal no code tools that are going to fill in all of the gaps around all of the ways that companies actually work that are not you don't like have industry a name standards. Of that specific use case, exactly. right? Exactly. <laughs> we we always used to call this like core apps and edge apps at mm-hmm. Airtable. Mm-hmm. Um and like the long tail of edge apps is where most work gets done. And we need the right tools for that. I think like Airtable and Softer are making that possible. And that's why I'm so excited about this particular piece of the puzzle. But I think every other piece is going to start bringing in some of that ethos because they have to. The consumers of today, the people who are making buying decisions today, like are not um technologically naive they grew up having yeah. more control over their experiences and they're going to demand that type of control from their uh from their tools and like frankly work changes too quickly to not have that available right. it is mm-hmm. a competitive disadvantage to be using something that does not have no code um yeah. and i think yeah. people are waking up into that and it's it means that like the internet's gonna be way better for all of us i hope that's my dream i love i love the way you describe it i couldn't say better uh <laughs> 
Definitely. I, I think I think you're right on point. And I actually, I was going to ask this, what you already kind of answered, uh, how our kids are going to, how, how kids in general are going to learn software. Because I think, I, I mean, in my mind, the actually the power of all of these tools and just generally empowering people to build software is even in our generation, the people are still kind of uh, lagging behind, right? They're still learning or some people are not even they don't, don't want to get into that. They don't want to build their own tools. But the next generation, as you said, they are already like, yeah. building their tools while at school. Um, yeah. So how do you think our, our kids are going to learn and like build their own software or yeah, not even working companies? Like how, how, how do you think that's going to change? I mean, I think they're already ahead of us. Like look at one of the most popular, like the most popular games for kids are like Roblox. That's literally building your own games. It's already happening. They're already ready. Right. Um, and I think that you're just going to see more and more of that. And of course, mm -hmm. like that doesn't mean that people aren't going to learn to go a layer deeper and start, you know, build it, like getting into the code and whatever else. Like there's always going to be a place for that. I don't think anyone thinks like that at some point it will become so abstracted with chat GPT and no code that no one will ever write code again. Like that's not going to happen. I don't think mm -hmm. personally, um, but it will create these incredible entry points to people um, and to our children to have the mental models to put together things that actually work. You know, so many of the places where I think current consumers have challenges are because like no one ever taught them how to make a product. No one ever taught them how to make a workflow. They're used to their tools teaching them how to do that or telling them how they have to do it. Right. And it's a big mind shift to say like, no, you actually get to decide for yourself. And like, here are the parts that make it possible to do that successfully. And I think kids are starting to learn that with things like Roblox. Um, and there will be even more of that uh, sort of helping them understand like, the fundamentals of how you put the pieces together. And that's what I'm really excited about. Yeah. Thank you so much, Zoel. I think this is a perfect point to end the conversation. <laughs> Thank you for the incredible conversation. And uh, yeah, you're sure sharing your uh, amazing insights. Thank you so Thank much. You have, Thank uh, you for where having can, me. Where can people find you on the internet? Yeah, so uh, I am on Twitter at Zoel. I'm also on LinkedIn. You can just look up my name. There's not that many of us uh, with my first name. Um, Otherwise, I, I spend a lot of time talking about online and digital safety. So um, if you're excited about no code, I definitely want to hear from you. If you're also excited about like having more control over your online experience from a safety perspective, I'm also your girl. Come find me. Uh, I love this stuff. And I'm excited to be helpful to anyone who's working in these spaces. Love it. Thank you, Zoe. Thank you so much. Thanks.